So with that said, let me now um, not take up any more time from you, Sastri. Let me uh, quickly introduce you and the panel. This is a panel on data and digital. We've had this panel each of the past few years. It feels different this year. It feels, as Lori Glimsher, for those of you who saw the oncology panel earlier in the day mentioned, we're now, it, it's happened. We're now not looking when does this happen or what does it look like? We're living it. And, and for better or for worse, it took a forcing function, which was the COVID-19 pandemic. So Sastri, you have a great panel of experts here and I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you so much, Andy. It's been a great set of sessions and, uh, and the last session was truly outstanding. Uh, with this panel, we really hope to dispel the myth that uh, digital and data science is something new that we're trying to do and something novel. Uh, I always like to remind people that we moved out of the analog era many years ago. And, and throughout the day, we've heard these stories from the front line, be it through the oncology panel or through the rare disease panel or around COVID, around the role that digital and uh, data science are playing. So we do have an all-star panel assembled here to talk about how they're meaningfully moving the needle across both their teams as well as the broader organization. Uh, so let me introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, so first up is Anne Hetherington. Anne is the head of Data Science Institute within R&D at Takeda, and she focuses on statistics, epidemiology, real-world, digital, and data. And she's most recently been leading the industry effort around uh, around data sharing for COVID as part of the COVID R&D alliance. Next up is Arpa Gare. She currently leads the global pharmaceutical business for Merck, and she also leads uh, data analytics, digital, and partnerships with a commercial organization where she's building the next generation commercial models and organizations. Third is Maya Said. She's the founder and CEO of Outcomes for Me, a Boston-based uh, digital health company that's focused on improving outcomes for oncology patients. And prior to that, she spent several years in senior executive roles at both Novartis and Sanofi. We also have Najat Khan. Najat is the chief data science officer and global head of R&D strategy at Janssen, and she focuses on maximizing the impact of data science uh, across the pipeline. And she's also a co-chair of the broader J&J &J Data Science Council. And then finally, we have Nina Shelson. Uh, Nina is an early stage investor at uh, Canon, a US venture capital focused both on health technology as well as healthcare. And she's been supporting biotech and digital health startups for more than two decades. Uh, we're really excited to have this panel and uh, we'll talk about this more, but uh, for the first time in 14 year history of USAIC, we have an all-star, all-woman panel. So it's something all of us have been uh, hugely excited about. So diving right in, uh, let me get us to the first question, and uh, and maybe we can go through in the order in which uh, I introduced you. So there's a tremendous amount of hype in the space, and there's a lot of investment money flowing in. Uh, where do you see the greatest opportunities across the board? Uh, what are some of the successes that you've experienced? But then more importantly, what do you see as the tipping point so that when we come back here next year, we can talk about here is what I called uh, at last year's USAIC. And then uh, where is COVID also serving as an accelerant? Because there are a lot of things happening, be it around telemedicine or use of real world data that, uh, that are dramatically accelerated because of the pandemic globally. So Anne, uh, why don't we start with you? Yes, thank you. And thank you to the USAIC for asking me to participate here today with all of my co-female leaders. It's wonderful. Um, and to the exact question, um, like actually, I think everybody around this virtual table. As someone who's worked on data since my PhD days and continues to rely on data every single day in my job, I actually don't really see this drive to data and digital as hype. I actually just see it as the rest of the world catching up with us and what we've been wanting to do and trying to do for many, many years. But that's not to say that um, the advance, with advances in computing power and analytics, we can't do more. Um, as demonstrated by uh, we at Takeda, we have um, an alliance, a collaboration with MIT at the intersection of AI and health. So we can definitely do more, but I don't see it as hype. And we should definitely not lose sight of the fact that actually data and algorithms and digital tools aren't the end game for us. At pharma, getting medicines to patients faster is the end game and everything is an enabler for that. 
And with regard to the question um, about the current pandemic, of course, we have seen so many ways the floodgates have opened. And for someone like me, it has been magnificent. But the one example I'd like to focus on is actually what you alluded to in my introduction, which is to do with the COVID R&D Alliance, where we have had at least 20 pharma uh, representatives around the table and talking about data sharing. And what we're moving to is a world where we will rapidly share data, both at a study level and at a patient level, as trials read out. And, it, and at the same time, we've had a group working on collaboratively working on real world data for COVID developing methods and protocols together. So the world has definitely changed with COVID and I, for one, am excited by what we can do with it moving forward. Harpa. Yeah, so just to build on Anne, and again, thank you also for inviting me to this panel. Um, to build on what Anne said around data and analytics being the core of R&D for you know, decades um, in the industry, I think from a commercial perspective, we have been focused on how do we get our medicines and vaccines to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And I think we have been slower to adopt data and technology in that, in that sort of journey. So from a commercial perspective, I think the opportunities are huge. Um, everything across the value chain from getting broader access um, across countries around the world based on the data that we have around the patients who could benefit and pricing and market access um, to patient identification, better understanding of which patients could benefit from which therapies, um, leveraging data that we have around clinical decision support um, in terms of when different therapies may be most beneficial. Uh, you can see a huge value even in supply chain on how to deliver differently to uh, different countries and different populations to reduce some of the disparities in care around the world. Um, and then last but not least, improve the broader outcomes, right? Help uh, leverage technology and data to um, help supplement the medicines and the vaccines to make sure that patients are getting the best outcomes that they have been promised. So the opportunities are significant across the value chain. I'd say where we have focused in the past on a commercial side has been more around looking at it more from an efficiency play. And I think what um, sort of the tipping point or the new sort of um, way to look at it is to think about what are all the opportunities to actually improve care and improve outcomes. And the more payers and consumers around the world start demanding more of sort of this outcomes-based approach, um, I think the more we will see um, better leveraging of analytics as well as technology including partnerships, right? I think that's the other sort of tipping point that I'm seeing is not everything has to be done by a single company. It's really around working through the ecosystem to find the players that can partner with us to get to those best outcomes. From a COVID perspective, I can give just one example. So I'm sure there is many more. Um, I think COVID has really accelerated a lot of the predictive aspects of the work that we do. So a specific example is, you know, when um, COVID, the pandemic first hit, we did a lot of predictive modeling to look at, at a country level, where do we expect increased utilization of some of our anesthesia products, um, just given all the intubations around the world. Uh, we were able to predict at a country level where we expected demand to increase and at what time period we were able to increase our, our supply and manufacturing of those products, as well as completely change our supply chain to make sure the countries that would need it at certain times would get it when they need it. So, um, I think you know that's just one example of how we are accelerating a lot of our predictive capabilities to get our medicines to the people who need them. So maybe I'll go next. Sastri, thank yeah. you for having me. Uh, for having me here, it's always a great pleasure to participate in this meeting. Um, so uh, you know, to build up on a few things and maybe to take it more from the patient angle. So the most exciting, uh, you know promise of digital health is really it has the potential to put back the patient at the center of the healthcare ecosystem. And, uh, and just to provide a bit of context in terms of what we do and hence kind of, you know, the opportunities I see from that angle, our mission at Outcomes for Me is to empower patients and improve outcomes. And we start with cancer. So some of the examples I'll be giving are linked to cancer. Uh, we do so by engaging cancer patients and enable them to take charge of their care. And in doing so, our goal is not only to improve patient outcomes, even though that's ultimately the goal, 
but also to accelerate research by collecting the data needed to drive innovation. So this is where you know data science becomes a very important component. Um, but in the past year, I think you know I'm most excited about you know five key opportunities. COVID being the last one, which is the accelerant. Uh, but uh, I'm getting some echo. But, uh, so the first being uh, the cons consumerization of healthcare. I mean, consumerization of everything. But we're starting to really see a real pull on the healthcare side from the consumer side. Patients demanding to be part of the decision, part of the information. We definitely see it with the people we interact with. These are patients that have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, the second is really around access to information. So. As uh, some of you, or maybe many of you uh, know, the CMS and the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, issued their final interoperability rule on May 1st of this year. Uh, this is gonna fundamentally, this is probably gonna be a major tipping point uh, because it will break down the barriers that impede patients' ease of access to their information in a digital format. Uh, and so it will accelerate that empowerment of patient and enabling to leverage that information to drive outcomes. Um, the third opportunity also happened this year or continuing to build is, you know, experiments, it, it's along the lines of value-based cares and experiments that we see regulators starting to take. So starting with, you know, the CMS Innovation Center has been doing in the past five years, uh, a number of experiments on new innovative payment models, but, um, the recent model, so the Oncology Care First model, which will launch next year, which is in succession to the Oncology Care model, which they had for the last five years, has two major changes in it, and in particular on the patient side. So it actually provides the potential to reimburse and to create value based on quality of life impact on patients, which I see as a, as a great opportunity and potential accelerant for digital health. And then the FDA has recently, actually just last month, uh, launched a program uh, to communicate patient reported outcomes from cancer clinical trials. And so this project, they call it Project Patient Voice, which you start seeing regulators really moving to really put the patient back at the center of the healthcare system. And then just on the science side, so here maybe I'll share some of the data we've seen recently. Lori mentioned earlier that you know, some of the greatest potential here is also around uh, you know, early screening, inherited cancers, but also genomic profiling and liquid biopsies. So just to give a sense of what we've seen recently, uh, only 50% of, pa of patients are tested either for genetic profiling or uh, inherited cancer among the ones that should be tested. And so if we can really move that needle, empower people to have a, a better conversation with their physician, which we've shown to be able to do, that could really drive more impact. Uh, just to give one example, in breast cancer, uh, which is a disease we're very present in, uh, there's been a recent uh, approval for a PIK3CA mutation, where 40% of patients with hormone positive HER2 negative breast cancer, advanced breast cancer, have that mutation. But our data shows that only a third of those people are even being screened for the mutation. So this is where we can see opportunities to quick, you know, enabling outcomes. So finally, in terms of COVID-19, I mean, a lot of it has been said, but I'll just, you know, highlight a couple. Telehealth, uh, you know, the movement to telehealth has an impact that not only providers are pretty much have really gotten into digital health, but also now they're embracing tools that help empower patients and manage them at a distance. And here I'm thinking about asynchronous patient reported outcomes. We see that in the context of clinical trials also. Uh, we're doing a clinical trial with MGH where the entire consenting system went online and remote, a fundamental shift for the organization. Uh, and then finally, where Laurie mentioned that unfortunately, there's been a huge backlog of screening now when it comes to cancer and potentially impacting the outcomes in the short term in terms of uh, overall uh, survival. Uh, here, digital health could play a huge role, a huge role in terms of getting people the information they need access much quicker when they need it quicker. 
so with that, maybe just to finish on the tipping point, you know, if I were to pick one, it would be patient access to their own data would be the real tipping point. Right, Nina. So you can tell from the introductions that I'm not the uh, the health IT genius on the panel. I'm the venture capitalist who is a broker and a backer of genius. So maybe I'll attempt to uh, to summarize a, a little bit of the the great comments that have been been made. Which is, I think the reason that there is hype about uh, big data or digital in in the ecosystem is because there's a sense that. Uh, data science has been slow to come to the biopharma industry. And, and I think that's a, a real misnomer, as, as Anne had said. We've been using uh, uh, data science and, and computational tools in our industry for a long, long time. And it's just staggering the pace at which we are accelerating discovery of new chemical entities using transcriptional and translational uh, omic data on the target side, and then fantastic uh, in silico computational screening and structural information on on the drug discovery side. Uh, on our portfolio um, at Canaan, where we do a significant amount of biopharma investing, you know, we're going from new biology, new pathway to uh, a candidate going into IND enabling in faster pace than, than we have seen in the 20 years that I've been in this business. It's, it's really exciting, whether that's a company like Vivachi that's dragging the hippo yap pathway, which has been previously undruggable, and they've gone to a, a candidate going into IND enabling work in less than three years, or Tyra going after gatekeeper mutations in uh, the entire scene kinase uh, inhibitors and following that path in, in target oncology, uh, going into a, a candidate development within uh, six months of, of investment. So data science, science is data science, I think, in drug, drug discovery. I think sitting uh, in a diversified fund at Canon where I have the privilege of uh, two thirds of our investments being on the tech side, I think they they sort of scratch their head at why is there not more um, sort of consumer and mobile and uh, empowerment and ready or access to that that data uh, because they see that disrupt every other industry much more readily and that of course is because our industry is a heavily regulated one and we have to deal with that I think that was ARPA's points about uh, the challenges on the commercial side and go to market and why it's more difficult because of liability reasons uh, privacy and security reasons. Uh, to, to access those data sets. And then also our industry, whether you're on the payer side or on the pharma side, is also a paranoid data hoarding, uh, very protectionist at times paternalistic industry. And so we haven't opened up and, and created large data sets. I think Hal Barron has pointed out that what we do in the pharma industry is you know, sophisticated multivariate analysis because we're dealing with data sets that are so small because they're not integrating. So side likes to laugh at us and say, you're not doing big data, you're doing small data with some statistics. So I think that's another reason why there's some thought about, about hyping. And so I think what we are facing a little bit is an existential question as an industry. You know, are we really going to democratize data? Are we going to open up? And how are we going to work in a regulated environment to really bring consumer insights, to bring open source, uh, to, to really liberate uh, the data for better, for better insights? Are we going to publish and make access to failed studies? Are we going to open up all the data uh, so that we can learn and accelerate for the interest of public health and, and, and global human health? Uh, I think that's something that, that we're going to have to wrestle with because consumers want better, public health needs better, and we as a society can't get to 50% of GDP going to, going to healthcare. And the industry, I think, can, can really solve, solve for that. Uh, aside from uh, incredible acceleration of drug discovery and that being a huge benefit of, of data science and computational power, the other places, of course, that we're seeing um, incredible opportunity generally is through uh, large data allowing us to make more consumer insight and customization, personalization of products and services in healthcare. Uh, that will come increasingly, I think, to biopharma as well. And the wraparounds around products for adherence and for a preferred site of care and, and for better better um, sort of precision uh, prescribing for the right drug to the right uh, patients. Uh, precision medicine, we have a cellular therapy. We're doing you know, really deeply personalized neoantigen T cells uh, for solid tumors. We think that has a real opportunity to eradicate solid, solid tumors. Um, and then of course in development, uh, really adapting clinical trials uh, for a better uh, diversity of enrollment, diversity of site and inclusion, virtual clinical trials have uh, synthetic control arms and, and the like using 
all sorts of data riches and alternate site and remote and mobility to, to better, better, uh, better execute the development of, of drugs and, and generating real world evidence as well. Right. I'll, I'll go next. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good um, ideas that have already been shared. Just to go back to the hype piece, I mean, I think I take a slightly different perspective on that in the sense that the last six months, both the internal and the eco external ecosystem, I think we've started to see convergence of real problems. And when I think about real problems, like just to echo what Anne said, it's how do we build and make better medicines for patients really start to happen. You know, and as Roy Vagela said, I think there has been for some time a lot of chatter. So it's exciting to see that the chatter is coming down with a lot of these data sets with exactly like specific problems that we're solving for. So I think that's that's at least my perspective. Um, in terms of the opportunities, I won't recap everything that's said, but I would say that there is a opportunity for connectivity, right? So if you think about a lot of these real world data sets um, across broader populations, but also more niche data sets that are coming through. As to think about how do we use that and it's happening actively, not just for approval purposes, but also for access that connects to sort of what ARPA was saying as well, but doing it much, much earlier uh, in the in the development timeframe, right? Because a lot of the data sets, the models, even the partnerships that we do, there's commonality across the board. So if we really think about scale at an enterprise at a cross value chain perspective, that is something that's uh, is going to be more uh, more and more important. And I think it's going to be critical for how we create scale. So if I have to think about the tipping point, Chastri, you mentioned, I think it's really going to be, how do we have endpoints that are more based on, or at least reflective in some way of the real world uh, data that we see? And you know that will help us not just with our um, uh, regulatory approval, but also access. I think that integration is going to become more and more tighter, especially when we think about oncology or also rare diseases where that integration already happens more today. And also this ties to other things like external control arms. And you know, Shastri, you're, you're very close to this work. How do we see that go beyond oncology and rare disease to other areas uh, where the standard of care is something that becomes important also for access perspective? And then I would say just going downstream, how we recruit patients, how do we match patients? Um, the whole feasibility process and monitoring. I think that um, there has been flickers of how we can do it differently, but I think more and more the right data sets are being pulled together. I would say more in the US. Um, XUS is still going to be not at the tipping point right now, but it's getting there. How do we do that in a completely different way? And we have had some success in that. And then the last thing I'll say, um, which is a challenge, I'd love to see more um, progress in that is when we build all these models and we have great data, a lot of it is around validation, making it explainable and then the validation. This is again, something that I think Roy Vagelis was saying, which is make, ensuring you have consistent high performance, not just a one-off, because that's really gonna drive traction with the clinicians, with commercial leaders across the board, right? If you think about the change management perspective, that's critical here. And there, I think not just validation in our programs, but the deployment of some of these algorithms through health systems that we partner with. So this goes beyond just biopharma through other organizations that we partner with. That is gonna be a really big tipping point if we can make a difference. I think we've talked about it, but if we have specific areas we can focus on, that can have a, a clear shift in how we, how we do our work, but also get it uh, embedded in the broader ecosystem to have impact. Last thing, you know, you mentioned in terms of COVID-19, completely agree on telehealth. One thing I would say, you know, Jane Jay, we've been working really hard on our COVID-19 vaccine as, as many of um, others in the, in the space have in the biopharma space. And it really has catalyzed how we not just embed the use of real world data. And I don't mean just claims or lab results, but even social media, mobility data, many, many different types of data sets that I would say tech companies and consumer companies are much more active using. But then actually do that early on in a program. Right. Today, a lot of the times it's an add-on, it's a check the box, but you know, it's, we should do something with data science versus actually using it in a meaningful way to understand the disease itself, given there's so many unknowns. We would love to see traction of that even going forward post in the post-COVID era. And we've used that, and I think Anne mentioned a little bit as well, to understand the severity distribution. It's a really hard problem, right? And really important for, her, for our vaccine program and our um, case endpoints to say, who's gonna get more sick and how do we detect, who are we gonna detect more in our clinical trials? Why is that important? 
if you get to events faster, it's a faster trial, it's deployed um, more quickly. Then the other thing I'd also say in terms of which countries to go to, so I think ARPA, you were mentioning understanding the utilization in certain products in the space, in, in, in like anesthetics and others in, in the commercial space, but also from a vaccine trial perspective, where do we expect the incidence to be high? Where should we target in terms of our trials? And you know, we've taken a very global perspective of that. Um, but I can imagine that such predictions would also be helpful in where not to go for other programs, and then also how to use it for other infectious diseases, other different models that we'll use. So those are just some of uh, some ideas where I think we can really leverage what we've already done, the good work already done today. Great. So I'm looking at the clock here, and I think we have about eight minutes left. So maybe I'll call on you for the next few questions. So. Arpa, uh, if you compare the tech leaders like Amazon and Facebook to a typical biopharma company, the EBIT per FTE is something like 5X higher for a tech company. I know the business models are different, but for me, it's more a measure of agility and speed. The organizations move faster, they kill, they make decisions faster, and this came up a little bit in the investment panel as well. So as you think of these large big pharma companies, what do you see as the biggest barriers or challenges to the broad-based adoption of digital and uh, data science? Yeah, so I think it's um, a multifactorial sort of um, set of issues. I'd say, um, I think the easy answer that a lot of people lean back on is around regulation, privacy, um, sort of where we're constrained and how we can operate directly with consumers or with payers or with customers uh, based on worldwide restrictions. That's certainly one issue, but from my perspective, I think the bigger issue is uh, a culture, a cultural bias almost, at least, um, that, that I see sometimes in terms of a risk aversion when it comes to healthcare to experiment in a way that maybe a tech company will experiment, um, a risk aversion to trying new technologies or new uh, you know, adopting new methodologies that are directly impacting a, a population or a or a patient's life, right? So, I think there is a, a cultural sort of bias towards um, sticking with what we have done, partly because what what we've done over the last couple of decades has been successful for the industry, right? So, I think there's a little bit of um, we have been successful until now. Um, and I think I think you know, there's also been, as I mentioned, the regulation. There's also been in different countries around the world, um, just significant fragmentation of data where we haven't been able to actually get the full value of what's possible. So um, I think it's multiple different things. That's where I see you know, this tipping point. I think Maya and others mentioned the consumers really getting empowered and taking charge will be a tipping point. Yeah. I think the other tipping point is clearly gonna be sort of governments and payers mandating more of a value-based or an outcomes-based um, approach to healthcare. And as soon as we get there, we're not going to be able to get there without fully leveraging the power of data analytics and digital technologies. So um, I, I do see this changing and I see it changing quickly, um, but it's going to require a lot of shifts in terms of culture, in terms of talent, and in terms of our business model. Got it. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this, call, of this meeting that it took us 14 years to have an all-women panel, and it would be a missed opportunity if we don't talk about uh, the broader opportunities for women in STEM as well as in the biopharma industry. So maybe we go in the reverse order, and Najat, start with you on what advice do you have for women who want to enter and, more importantly, thrive and grow and lead in this space? Yeah, I know. I'm so glad we are having this conversation. You know, we have this, I'm sure all of us do on this panel on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know, when I saw the question, I was reflecting a little bit um, on what was important for me. And I would say two things. One, now I always say, if you want to go into a space, especially when I think about all different fields, not just data science, it is becoming more and more interdisciplinary, right? And you have a team of epidemiologists, stats, data scientists, data engineers. I mean, a lot of us do. It's really important to know a lot of different areas and skills, as well as the science. So what I always say is start with yourself to really be honest, is this an area I'm interested in? And if so, you will always be leaning in one field more from a trained perspective, and then another field more from a self-trained perspective, right? If I look at my own background, it's the same thing. So how, be proactive first, 
to really make sure you sweat the details to be the best you can be in the space you want to thrive in. So that's number one, I always say, focus on yourself. And for that, it actually, it's super helpful to have a community of folks you can reach out to. You know, not all great ideas are in one's head or in a book, and the space is constantly evolving. So I don't like to use the word network because it sounds a little, I don't know, it's overused, but to actually have folks in your community that you just know you can reach out to. So that's one. How do you make the best of what you can do? And then, then I think there's another aspect that gets less talked about. It's talked about more in the headlines that we should have diversity and inclusion. We should have more women. We should, But really think about um, investing your time in a company, biotech, startup, wherever, with a group of people that share that same vision. Share the vision in terms of what's the overall mission to help patients that are medicine. But then also really just not just talk the talk, but walk the talk in terms of will um, support and ensure that there's diversity on those teams, that there's a plan in terms of how do you actually promote women. And I, I don't mean promote just from a job perspective, but promote in terms of ensuring that's the right opportunity to thrive. And you know, that's something that requires a lot of conversation. And it's the worst thing to be in the wrong place where there's a lot of hype in terms of we do this and then you get to the job and it doesn't really happen. There isn't that day-to-day -day support that's needed. So I think both those aspects are so critical to be successful, one's inherent and intrinsic to yourself. And the other is, I always say being a good detective and really keeping your ears open to understand how is that place where you're going to invest the time going to support you back. So it's a co-investment. Nina? Yeah, I would echo that. I would say to the girls or the women, go for it. That advice is really simple. You go for it and hang in there. You deserve to thrive in an amazing field. Biopharma and digital health, health sciences, health IT is a fantastic career path. It is the most rewarding to be making medicine for patient and public good uh, and excel at it and enjoy, uh, go for it. And the advice is really to the organizations and to the managers out there. Um, it is more than time for diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is more than time for that girl and that woman not to have to do the work and do the heavy lifting. Um, look at your policies, look at your organization, look at your culture and have zero excuses for why a woman, an LGBTQ, a black or brown person would not want to or be able to go all the way and thrive at your place of work. Mm -hmm. um, this is fantastic that it's an all woman panel. It's fantastic that there were women and people of color all over this agenda. And so hats off to Andy and Karun for that. Um, it's time, it's more than time. Maya? Yeah, so maybe, uh, I mean, I agree with everything that has been said. Uh, maybe just to, uh, so I'll add two things. Well, I'll add one thing and I'll, uh, I'll reiterate another one. So uh, to the to the person kind of looking to enter the space, I would, uh, or kind of, you know, like um, early in her career, my biggest advice is don't undersell yourself. And the reason I really say that is as an as a, as a early stage company, we've been recruiting a lot and most recently since COVID, and now I see it systematically where women tend to undersell themselves and not even apply for a role because they don't have all the parts of that role. So that would be my advice. Uh, and then to the organization, I mean, I'll just, I agreed, I agree with what Najat and Nina said, but I will emphasize something that Nina said, which is culture. Uh, culture gets said very early on, and especially in the pure tech or digital health, health tech, you know, the engineering culture and how you want that to be, uh, pay attention to it because that's essentially going to be how diverse the company is going to end up once as it's growing. All right, Arpa and then. So I'll, um, I completely agree with everything that's been said. I might just take a slightly different uh, twist on the question as I think about, um, I'm, I'm a parent, I have three children. One of them is a daughter and um, the other sort of call to action I would throw out there as we think about the longer term is um, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that early exposure to STEM and to these types of careers is really um, the tipping point, right? So 
Um, I think I would encourage all the viewers to also think about the, the younger generation and making sure that we're supporting them and exposing them to STEM as early as possible. Um, because there's a lot of evidence to show by the age of 10 or 12, if you haven't seen or been exposed to or um, had interest in or been inspired by others um, in the field, it's very, very difficult to change that going forward. So um, from a long-term perspective, I think there's a lot we can do, whether it's as mentors, sponsors, uh, or as companies um, to help from a long-term perspective as well. And I have four very, very simple things to add. One is get educated, get out there, get your education. And frankly, a PhD is international. It goes everywhere with you. Number two, say yes. Opportunities are exactly that, not extra work. Number three, and I think it goes back to the community, solid foundation, family, friends, and people that challenge you and make you push yourself. And lastly, actually, particularly in this data and digital space, don't be put off by all these differing terminologies of data architects and data engineer and exposure of data. It's all just data and mathematics. And if you know that, you're fine. Fantastic. I think we're out of time here. So my apologies to Anil Sawant and Peter Muller who had amazing questions around the role of regulators in terms of uh, software as a medical device, as well as uh, thinking around uh, how do you start to break the silos between the various uh, parts of the organization within pharma companies. And I'm sure we can keep this conversation going on uh, for a much longer time than what, what we have here. So I'd like to thank the panel a lot for giving us their time and their advice and insights. Uh, it has been truly exciting and we look forward to getting together again next year, hopefully in person.